Okay, so um, let's get started. We'll pray and then we'll dive right in. Okay, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to look into your word, Master. Lord, we thank you that, uh, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us, O oh God, through the, Lord, the written word, Lord, by the quickening of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And even as we take time to journey through, O oh God, your word, Master, we pray that, um, Lord, there will be many insights. Lord, we pray that there will be, uh, Lord, you will expand our understanding, Father God, our knowledge and understanding. And above all, O oh God, may we, Lord, experience the power, Lord, of your spirit. Lord, I pray that we will experience, O oh Father God, the revelation and impartation that bring that you bring, O oh God, through your spirit, O oh Father God. We thank you. We give you all the praise. We commit this course. We commit this semester into your mighty hands in each one of us, God. We thank you in Jesus' matchless name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry. They cannot hear. Um, okay. I'm not sure. It's correct. Is this, uh, is this the one? Check, 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 huh? no? Check, 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 check. Can you hear? No. OK, um, Jackin is able to hear. Who else? Um, if, you, if you're able to hear, can you just put a thumbs up, please? Um, yeah? OK. OK. Um, okay, fine. Is it okay? Uh, Nina, can you hear? Are you able to? Maybe it's something to do with the setting there? Or? Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, okay. Okay, just check it out because um, we're able to hear. Um, Okay, so um, so this semester we're going to look at um, uh, we're doing a you know a word study um, a book study sorry a book study on uh, first and second Corinthians right so we're going to go through um, first and second Corinthians very interesting uh, and uh, you know just like any book study we will look at the context we look at uh, some of the historical backgrounds the geography of the place and all all that um and then uh, there will be many takeaways right there will be many um, many things that we can actually apply in our lives as well and not only will it be uh, will it give us a you know uh, expand our uh, knowledge and understanding of why paul said what he said and uh, how he wrote this and from where he wrote this and and the context and so on right so so yeah, so um, let me just share the notes. Um, online students, you can download the uh, notes from from the classwork section. It's uploaded there. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So Paul, who wrote the the letter? Of course, Paul. Paul wrote these letters, and to whom does he write? Corinthians and where is Corinth? Um, in Greece, right? You said Greece. You don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So Corinth in modern day Greece, it's also you know today also it's called Corinth, um, but we don't know whether you know the exact region um, if if it in involves all the region of uh, you know of uh, of the historical times, if that is also you know there geographically today, right? So, but um, yeah, today also it's called Corinth, but it's spelt with a K K O R I N T H, right? Corinth. Now, um, so we'll get into a, you know a little bit of uh, background about the city, okay, about the uh, city when it uh, at the time when it was uh, when Paul visited and when Paul wrote to them. Um, so we see that uh, it was established as a colony of um, of people, and uh, it was on a very ancient site, and it was established by Julius Caesar, right? One of the uh, one of the emperors, one of the Roman commanders um, uh, of Rome, right? So it became the capital of the Roman province, 
uh, in 27 BC and so on. So you know, it very uh, very lavish place, right? Buildings, uh, amphitheaters, and uh, it, it was known for luxury. It was also known for a very moral lifestyle. Okay, so when when somebody said, okay, uh, you know, somebody's from Corinth, or you know, it means that people were actually used to a very moral lifestyle. So that is what it meant, right? And uh, you know, like. They used to say, uh, if, if, if somebody said, okay, this is a Corinthian girl, that means actually that, that the person had an immoral lifestyle or maybe even sold, you know, was involved in commercial sex activity and all that, right? So, but it was also called as the ornament of Greece, Greece because it was a commercial center. There was a lot of trade and, you know, economy and, um, you know, commerce and literature and all those things were there. So there were two harbors. <coughs> Excuse me. And the estimated population was about 200,000 people. Okay. So one thing to uh, understand about Corinth, about um, the, the kind of uh, philosophy they had, the kind of religion you know, which was there, they had two deities. One is Apollo or Apollo. And there was also this deity called the Aphrodite. Aphrodite. Okay. So Apollo, Greek god of... You know, sun and knowledge and medicine and and all that poetry and everything, and uh, there was a temple for Apollo, and um, apparently even today some of those columns of those temples are still present. You know, in those ruins, right? Then the other deity was Aphrodite, which means she was a Greek goddess of love, right? Love in the immoral way, right? So there was this high hill called Acro Corinth on which this temple was built and supposed to be the highest structure at, of those times, right? And it was very immoral. The worship itself was immoral, where there was a you know a immorality in terms of prostitution and everything going on in the temple itself. So it was an act of worship for them to prostitute themselves, right? So they had you know apparently they had about thousand. Uh, male and female prostitutes and all that. So you see that that was the that. So this was considered as religion. So the uh, the values of the people, you know, if this was considered as religion, as sacred, in regular life, in everyday life, the values were completely moral, right? So it was completely upside down. So that was the city. Okay. So worldliness, sexual sin, and everything was very rampant, and you know. And obviously, no sense of right and wrong, etc. So such a such a place. And also, you know, when Paul writes uh, in the book of Acts, he talks about the marketplace um, where people sold and bought, and uh, there was a lot of goods that was there. And and because it was a port, a harbor, uh, trade was also very uh, you know very robust, which means that there were exports, imports coming in. Right, whenever there is a harbor. There is a lot of you know commerce that happens, like ships come bringing in goods, ships go out to other countries taking goods and selling and so on. So a lot of export and import happening there. So so we see that uh, when Paul writes about uh, you know meeting Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth and how they were tent makers, so they could actually you know they could sell whatever they were making and uh, and uh, they could actually make uh, make a living. Like so, so Paul writes about that, and also that the fact that he engaged with people right in the marketplace, or what was called as the agora. Okay, so when did Paul go to Corinth, or when was this church in Corinth established? Okay, so when we read the book of Acts, right? If you if you turn to book of Acts, and if you look at chapter eighteen or seven sixteen onwards, right? Uh, 16 onwards is when, um, uh, or maybe you know, it's, it starts when uh, in 15 itself, right? Chapter 15 and verse 36 is when Paul starts his second missionary journey. Okay, so let me just share the uh, map over there. Okay. Um, 
Okay. So you see the um, map there. Um, so Paul, on his second uh, missionary journey, that's when he goes to uh, Corinth. So if you see that he's making a a big journey, long journey, right? And um, so this is, you know, he starts from Antioch. Um, you can see the map. It starts from Antioch, goes to Tarsus and Lystra and Derby and you know, and to the other Antioch, which it in which is in Pisidia. Then he goes, uh, you know, uh, Phrygia and all these areas. Um, then he goes to the region of Macedonia. You know, Macedonia, which means uh, all these places like Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, uh, and all these places. And from there, he goes to Achaia, then Athens. Okay? And then we read about what, you know, Paul does in Athens. Um, he, he sees these all these idols and everything, and, you know, he engages with them as well. And finally, he goes to Corinth. Okay. So from Athens, he goes to Corinth. And uh, Acts chapter 18 says that that is where he, you know, you, you can see Corinth. It's a port city. And uh, so that is how he reaches Corinth, right? And he's traveling uh, with um, Silas and uh, Barnabas and, and John Mark. They go to Cyprus and Silas and Paul. They travel and they go to all these regions and they arrive at Corinth. Okay. So... Um, Okay, so uh, Paul, on going to Corinth, and that is where he meets uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, so he meets them, and in chapter 18 of Book of Acts, he, he says that he meets there. They were Jewish believers. They had come from Rome, and because Claudius Caesar, he, uh, he was the emperor, he, he issued a command that, all these Jews, Jews should leave Rome, so that's how they come and they meet. And and uh, Paul says that uh, you know they were they were also tent makers, right? So so they were there and they were uh, working there. Acts chapter eighteen and verse four talks about how he goes to the synagogue and how he reasons with the uh, with the Jews and the Greeks, right? So Acts chapter four, uh, sorry, Acts chapter eighteen, verse four. Uh, let me just read. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Uh, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And then they blasphemed, they opposed him, and he goes from there. And then we read about certain names that are mentioned there. You know, there is this person called Justice who is mentioned. Um, and there is someone who, uh, you know, who was actually next door to the synagogue. Then there is a person by name Crispus, who is the ruler of the synagogue. Um, then, uh, then there's somebody called Gaius and the household of Stephanus. And all these people were the early believers in Corinth. So they were part of the first church in Corinth or the early church in Corinth. Right? So we we so Acts chapter eighteen gives the information about what happened when Paul went to Corinth and how the church was established and so on. So, so um, Acts chapter eighteen talks about the fact that Paul was there for about eighteen months, one and a half years. He was teaching, he was establishing people in the Word and in the works of the Spirit and so on. Right. So it it also talks about. This man called uh, Romans chapter 16 says there was this person called Erastus, like who was actually a treasurer of the city. So we are talking, we are looking at who were these people who were part of the early church in Corinth, right? So we have people like this, you know, Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, Justice, who was the man next to the synagogue. Then we ha also have Erastus, who was a high-ranking official in the city of Corinth. Right, so probably he was like a mayor or somebody who was uh, who was like a, an official who was in charge of you know some legislations in the city and so on. Because there was an inscription there, inscription meaning there was a stone, you know, uh, like an inscription uh, stone on which it was inscribed, saying that you know this man Erastus actually paved the road out of his own 
expense out of his own money. So obviously a person of influence and a person who was wealthy enough to do that, right? To, to in fact, fund one of those city infrastructure projects, right? So uh, obviously a wealthy man, right? Something, somebody like a treasurer of the city and, and so on. So, so all these people were part of the church. And when we read 1 Corinthians, we see that, okay, they were also people who were previously engaged in all kinds of immoral activities. Like Paul says, and he says, you know, you were involved in all kinds of sinful activities, immoral lifestyles, such were some of you, but then you were saved and washed. And, you know, he, he, he says that. So, um, so all these people were there in Corinth. Okay. And some other thing that we can note is that from Corinth, Paul writes the epistle to the Thessalonians, to the Thessalonian church, right? So Thessalonian, uh, sorry, the, the, the region of Thessalonica, Paul actually goes and, you know, he he comes to, from there he comes to Corinth, right? On his second missionary journey, if you see, Derby, Lystra, and then he goes to all these places, Philippi, you know, Beria, Philippi, and you know, Thessalonica is also mentioned as one of the places, right? Philippi, then uh, Thessalonica, and then, um, uh, you know, sorry, uh, and then it talks about Beria, and then, oh uh, yeah, Thessalonica, Beria, and uh, Athens, and Corinth. So that's the route he takes, right? So, um, so we see that from Corinth, he writes to the Thessalonians. Okay, so... And it's, when we're reading the book of Thessalonians, we, we realize, okay, he was in Corinth. He spent about one and a half years there. And from there, he is instructing the Thessalonians. Right? Okay. So, um, he also, in, in the book of Romans, so, so from when we read Acts, when we read the book of Romans, we get information about how Paul ministered in Corinth. Like, who were those people? In, in addition to reading First and Second Corinthians, when we read the book of Acts, when we read the book of Romans, you know, we get some information. Okay, this is what Paul did because it's mentioned there, right? What he did and who he um, um, ministered to, etc. Okay. So uh, Acts chapter eighteen also talks about the fact that Paul left; uh, he moved away from Corinth. Okay, so let's look at that part. Um, Okay, um, from Corinth, okay, he uh, it says in verse um, chapter eighteen, verse eleven says he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Okay, and then it says um, verse eighteen says so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. Okay, so from there he goes to the Syrian region, and Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila also uh, travel along with him. Right, so he goes to this area called Sincrea, and from there he goes to Ephesus. Okay, so um, so this is something that we see in Ephesus. We read about how uh, Priscilla and Aquila meet. Uh, this man called Apollos, right? 18, chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Now, so we, are, we are still looking at the background, you know, uh, to the book, right? And this is in the second missionary journey, okay? And it's important for us to understand, okay, um, all the things that are happening there and why is he writing what he is writing to the Corinthians, right? So uh, Apollos is there, Apollos is in Ephesus, and Priscilla and Aquila correct him, right? That's what they do. Right, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, let's read that. Um, verse 24. Okay, there was a certain man named Apollos from Alexandria, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. And now this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit and, and taught accurately the things of the Lord, but he knew only the baptism of John. Right? So he did not know, he did not go beyond that. Which means that um, the baptism in water in the name of Jesus he did not know, um, uh, and and probably you know the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and all that that he also may not have been aware of. So Aquila and Priscilla teach him, right? And then he you know he, he goes about ministering now even more accurately and uh, and powerfully, 
and also he also goes to you know Corinth and and all these regions and he's ministering there, right? Because chapter 19 talks about the fact that Apollos goes to Corinth. So this church at Corinth, established by Paul, and Apollos was also one of the ministers who taught there, right? So he must have it must have been a real powerful time of teaching because now he and you know, Apollos knew the scriptures just like Paul. Uh, he it, it says that he refuted the Jews in the synagogues. You know, nobody could actually you know because he was he was very sure and he was actually very strong in the scriptures and he explained things and and uh, it was an eloquent man also, right? So so we see that he goes and he also ministers in Corinth, okay? And that we come to know when we read chapter nineteen, verse one. Apollos was at Corinth, and Paul it says Paul goes to Ephesus. Okay, now this is Paul's second visit to Ephesus. So this is actually when we read about uh, you know uh, Paul's second visit to Ephesus. That means that this is actually his third missionary journey. Okay, so Paul's missionary journeys start from where? From where does he start? First missionary journey, second missionary journey. Where does he start from? Huh? No, where does he start his journey? Okay, so that's you know that's quite important, right? Because Paul, when we when we study the book of Acts, we see that Barnabas goes, brings Paul from Tarsus, takes him to Jerusalem, gets him to meet with the disciples, and both of them come to Antioch, right? This place called Antioch in Syria. And we read about this church in Antioch, which is a you know, which is quite a um, you know spiritually very strong church. It's um, you know we in Acts chapter thirteen we read there were prophets, there were teachers. Paul was there, Barnabas was there, and there were other people you know who are mentioned there: Simeon and Lucius and, and Niger and all these people were there. So they were all you know um, like uh, teachers, prophets. So it was a very spiritually buzzing, active church in Antioch, right? And when they pray, when they fast and pray, they minister to the Lord. The Holy Spirit tells them, "Set." The Holy Spirit speaks and says that, "Set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them." Okay, that we read in Acts chapter thirteen, right? So from then on, from there on, starts Paul's missionary journey so that's the first missionary journey you know from antioch he goes and comes back to antioch right so in acts chapter 18 he goes from antioch you know goes to all these places uh spends about a year and a half in corinth and then goes back to antioch sankria and then antioch so it says in verse 22 of acts chapter 18 the end of Paul's second missionary journey. Okay, so he started at Antioch. He goes back to Antioch. It says, um, and gone up and greeted the church. He went down to Antioch. So there is the second missionary journey ends. So when he travels again from Antioch, that is his third missionary journey, right? So from Antioch, Paul goes to Ephesus. So this is his third missionary journey. So we see. That um, in Ephesus, sorry, uh, sorry, in um, uh, Corinth, from Corinth, he writes to Thessalonians, Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians and second Thessalonians, he writes from Corinth. Okay. So now is we're we looking at this third missionary journey. He goes to Ephesus, he's ministering in Ephesus, and from Ephesus is where he writes this epistle that we are going to study, the first Corinthians. He writes from Ephesus. Okay, so how long does he stay in Ephesus? Any idea? Huh? Three years, right? He teaches there in the school of Tyrannus. We read that about that in Acts chapter nineteen. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter nineteen. Okay, Acts chapter nineteen, verse nine says that he reasoned daily in the school of Tyrannus. Okay, and this continued for how long? For two years. Right, two years he taught there. 
But finally, when he moved from Ephesus, it was after three or three plus years, right? Okay, so from Ephesus, he writes a couple of epistles, letters. Okay, he writes to the Galatians because the Galatian church also, he has actually met them. He also, um, I'm sorry, uh, he writes to Galatians, he writes to the Corinthians, right? Um, okay. Then, um, from there, from Ephesus, after staying there for three years, three odd years, three plus years, after he moves from there, he goes to the region of Macedonia, okay, uh, from Corinth. So that is uh, part of his third missionary journey. And, um, sorry, one second, please. Um, let me stop sharing that. Um, just a minute, sorry. Okay, so, yeah. I'm sorry, I thought all the while I was sharing the notes. Um, okay, so um, Paul goes to Macedonia from Ephesus. And uh, when we say, when we talk about Macedonia, you know, that whole region of Macedonia, it includes these cities, like Neapolis, Philippi, right? Philippi, which means Philippians, um, Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, Berea, and all these places. Okay? And in this region, Paul writes the second epistles to the second epistle to the Corinthians. So where did Paul write first Corinthians from? From Ephesus, right? So he writes to them. So the background is this that um, Paul was there, and then he gets news that all is not well in Corinth. Okay, so he has gone there. <clears throat> Corinth, of course, very moral city. You you know you look at it. Sometimes we look at some of these cities, some of these places, and think that okay, how can the gospel be shared here? You know, how can a ch church be established here? Right? It was what would what we could call as one of the sin cities of the world, or you know, where immorality was rampant, where people did not know what was right, what was wrong. Everything is twisted, right? And in today's world, you know, we see some cities like that. You know, we see, you know, uh, communities like that where right is wrong and wrong is right, right? So Corinth was such a city, and Paul establishes the church there. The church grows, and uh, then he hears about the fact that, okay, all is not, you know, everything is not okay with that church. And that is why he writes to them. Okay. And um, so, so this letter to the Corinthians, this first letter to the Corinthians was probably written, you know, approximately around AD 58, right? Because 53 to 57 would have been his second missionary journey uh, and, or, you know, overlapping going beyond 58 also. So from, from here, uh, he writes this um, epistle. Okay. So when we say, okay, how long was it after establishing the church? Uh, it was probably around seven years, okay, about seven years uh, after right, e establishing the church. So uh, such so a church is now seven years old, right? There are believers, there are people being added to the church and so on, uh, and they are facing some challenges there. Good things are happening and also some very challenging things are happening. Okay, so so it's important for us to remember. Okay, where did Paul write from? From Ephesus. Uh, around what time did he write? Uh, you know, in terms of date, probably about AD fifty-eight or so. And how long after the church was established did he write? Probably about seven years after the church was established. Okay, so so let's look at chapter one. Okay, uh, I hope this is clear. If there are any doubts, you can you know put it on the chat or ask as well. Okay, right. Okay, so um, so let's move on, right? Acts chapter, sorry, one Corinthians, chapter one. Okay, so so as usual, it's a letter, right? So Paul 
greets people. Normally, when you write a letter, we say, okay, hello, so-and-so, right? So he's greeting people to whom he is addressing. He's also introducing himself, right? So it says, Paul called to be an apostle. Let's read verse 1, 2, and 3. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is his usual greeting. He writes the greeting and, and he writes to them about this. He introduces himself. How does he introduce himself? Verse 1, he says, Paul, who's called to be an apostle. Okay, we, we know that, you know, the apostle means, okay, one who's sent out. Okay, a sent out one, one who's sent out with a commission, uh, one who's one who goes out as an ambassador, representing a nation, representing a you know a group of people, etc. Uh, maybe a messenger. So Paul is saying, you know, I'm called, meaning the Greek word says, you know, invited, I'm appointed to be a messenger, to be a ambassador. Okay, so so which means that hey, this is the will of God. You know, he's he, he says through the will of God. I'm called and I'm sent out. Okay. So he's obviously referring to both his, the way he was saved. Um, he's referring also to, you know, the way in which uh, Ananias came and prayed over him. Right. He prayed and he said, you know, God has a plan for you. He's called you to, you know, that to be a voice, to be, you know, among the Jews and Gentiles and everything. Because that's what God says, right, to Ananias. When Anna, he, Paul is blind, he's in the house uh, of this person called Judas and, and uh, in, uh, in Damascus, right? And then Ananias goes and prays and says, you know, he receives his sight and also the call of God. You know, this is what I, I need to do. And he's, he starts preaching immediately, right? So, so he's saying, I, this is a call of God. And also... We know that in the church in Antioch, when the elders and everyone was praying, God spoke very clearly, saying, "Okay, this is the God, this is the work that I have for them, so they need to be, you know, separated for this work." So, so Paul is referring to all that, and he's saying, "You know, I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called to be a messenger and ambassador, according to the will of God. It's not something that I took up myself. It's not something because I like to travel and meet people and you know go to new places and all that. But this is the call of God." And he also mentions another person, Sosthenes. Okay, so in the in the in the book of uh, Acts, in chapter eighteen, we read about Sosthenes. So probably it's the same person, you know. In Acts chapter eighteen, let's just uh, go there where and see where he's mentioned. Um, <clears throat> okay, Acts um, eighteen, verse seventeen. Okay, Acts eighteen, verse seventeen. It says, "Then the and all the Greeks." took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogues. He's, he's also another, you know, a, a person who's in charge of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat and Gallio took notice of these things. So he's mentioned there. So probably, you know, Sosthenes, if it's the same person, he joined Paul, started to travel with him, right? So, and he's with him in Ephesus and... Um, you know, Paul is writing. So he says, you know, he includes Paul, uh, sorry, Sosthenes also in the uh, greeting, right? Okay, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to the church. Um, so what is the church again? When you say church, does it refer to a building? Does it refer to a place? What does the church mean? Right? People, right? Church, the Greek word used there is ecclesia, which means the people, the assembly of God's uh, assembly of people, actually. And this word ex ecclesia was also used secular terms, right? Not just for the church. Uh, it was used for a gathering, assembling of people, you know, people, maybe a council that was gathering together. So it just meant an assembly, right? So he's saying, okay, this is an assembly of people who were called out for a purpose, right? So he says, okay, the church of God, which is at Corinth, you know, in the city of Corinth, here is this group of people. And uh, you are sanctified, you are separated, and the word used there, you know, uh, is uh, sanctified hagidzo, which means you are separated, set apart, consecrated to God. 
and you know we are called to be saints right so which means that saint the title saint is not i mean the word saint is not a title as used in some you know some backgrounds right religious backgrounds like okay we are giving them this person you know, this title of sainthood right or people also make jokes you know who do you think you are some saint right so holy you think you are a saint right so we see that the usage of saint means that you are a separated one right you are consecrated one holy holy consecrated made by god that right? separated consecrated by the blood of jesus right so we are sanctified means we are set apart consecrated holy unto jesus so he's mentioning that you know you you are this he's talking to the church he's talking to the believers you know and i'm writing to you the ecclesia the assembly of people who are sanctified right and and he says who in in every place call on the name of jesus christ our lord okay so well yeah he was writing this to the corinthian church and he's also writing to to a bigger group of people okay he says who in every place call on the name of jesus christ our lord so he's not only the corinthian believers but also people who are beyond corinth everyone else okay verse 3 grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ okay the word grace means charis right it means favor it means character it means enablement right it means the gifts of god all that right so he's saying grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ okay so so he's saying okay you know this is yours grace and peace Uh, harmony and security and safety and prosperity you know that word peace means all that the greek word irene so he's saying you know grace to you and peace from god so he's just declaring that blessing them with the grace and peace that comes from god okay okay let's move on to um, okay we have time let's move on to verse 4 for verses 4 to 9 right it says i thank my god always concerning you for the grace of god which is given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our lord Jesus Christ God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our lord okay, so verse 4 he says i thank my god always concerning you so um just gives a insight into what you know paul is that paul is praying for his the people who whom he ministered to the people whom he met etc right excuse me so he says you know i thank my god you know he's is giving thanks for all the good things that are happening in the church he says i thank my god always concerning you for the grace of god which was given to you right um uh the the you experience his favor you experience the gifts you are experiencing his divine enablement divine character i thank my god okay so later on you know even in the same chapter or you know same chapter paul writes about some of the challenges which are there okay some problems that are there and the people who are causing the problems and people who are experiencing the problems but still he thanks god for them and the work of jesus the work of the holy spirit in their lives right um so he says you know i thank god for the grace of god which was given to you by christ jesus you know there is the grace of god which is available for all of us right romans 5 talks about that there is the grace of god which is available for all of us and he there is also the special specific grace which god gives according to the call right so if you look at romans 12 and verse 3 he he writes about that this grace that was given to me in order to do these things right romans 12:3 he he says that um maybe we can look at that verse okay romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says for i say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think etc 
right? And also in Ephesians 4, he again writes about this grace that was given to him specifically. So, you know, so he's talking to the people, right? Ephesians 4 and verse um, 7, to, but each one grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Ephesians 4 verse 3. Ephesians 3 verse 3 also says, you know, that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. So he's saying, you know, I received this by the grace of God, right? So he's saying, you know, as believers in this church called Corinth, you have the special grace of God. God has graced you with certain things to call. Why is why does God give that grace, the divine enablement to fulfill the call? Right. So every believer has received that grace from God in order to fulfill the call of God. Right. So as a church, as a body of believers, we have the grace of God. What does he say in verse 5? Okay, verse 5 says that you were enriched in all things. Okay, what does enrich mean? Made rich, right? Abundantly given. So he says you were enriched in everything. And then goes on to explain, you know, you were enriched in everything by whom? By the Lord. By him, right? By the Lord. And enriched in all things, right? And particularly, he talks about in all utterance and knowledge. Okay, utterance, the word used there is logos, meaning everything that is spoken. Um, and also everything, you know, the word used there is knowledge, gnosis, which means that understanding and so on. So in the context of what he's going to write, what he's going to address, we can infer that he's actually talking about the gifts that they were enriched with. The gifts of the spirit that they were enriched with, right? Because he, he he goes on to talk about that also, you know, in the in the next few verses, right? You were enriched um, in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge. So utterance, I mean, maybe the vocal gifts, right? We learned about that, the vocal gifts like tongues, interpretations of interpretation of tongues, prophecy. And, uh, you know, revelation gifts, right? It's talking about word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and so on. So we can infer that he's referring to these gifts. He's saying, you were enriched. So so when we, when we think about the church in Corinth, we see that this was a church that was moving in the gifts, right? He's saying, God gave you that, and you were enriched in it, okay? Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, okay? So which means that, you know, you're... The testimony as a witness, the testimony of a witness, um, and the word used there is a very powerful word. You know, the testimony. It means martyr, somebody who is who gives up one life for the cause, right? So he's saying that uh, you know the testimony of Christ, uh, being a martyr, right, was confirmed in you. The evidence was evidence. So he's saying you know even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, um, right? So. Uh, in 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 this manner, this this testimony was brought to you. It is with evidence, um, in demonstrations of spirit and so on. Right, verse seven. He goes on to say, "You come short in no gift." Right, which means that hey, there's you're not falling short of any gift. Right, all these gifts, everything that. Uh, that he's, that he's going to write about. He's saying, you know, you are very gifted. You have re received the gifts of the Spirit. You are very gifted. Uh, you got the revelation and everything. You come short and no gift. right? It is there. And you're also eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a church which is spiritually very gifted, which is very enriched. They are falling short in no gift. Right? And uh, and also we see that they are eagerly waiting for the revelation of the Lord, which means they are in expectation of Christ's return. Right. So this expectation is what is you know causing them to live the life in which they are living. Right. So okay. So a couple of things for us to understand. Right. Now later we're going to see the problems that which church has. Okay. But Paul is acknowledging that. It's a good thing to have these gifts. Like sometimes we look at it, you know, this church, or this person is gifted, or this church is gifted, but they have problems in their lives. So maybe they should just fix that first and then 
you know, think about the gifts or pursuing the gifts or the use of the gifts. Now, Paul doesn't tell them that. Right? Paul doesn't say, okay, stop using these gifts. Fix those problems first. Pro problem of character and, you know, unity and all that. Fix that first. No, he doesn't say that. He says, you know, you, it needs to go. Both needs to go hand in hand. Right? He says, um, we need to continue to grow. We need to continue to mature. We must, you know, uh, yeah, we need to grow in our Christ-likeness and continually, you know, have this abundance of the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Right? So that is what we see. He's acknowledging that, affirming that, hey, you come short in no gifts. Right? Okay. And uh, later we will see that, you know, he's, this is a gifted church, but he's also calling them. You know, you are spiritual babies in Christ, you are carnal, etc. So the difference between spiritual maturity and spirituality. Okay, we'll address that a little later. Okay. And verse 8 says, okay, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord Jesus will confirm, establish, make firm, secure. And so that you can be presented blameless. Um in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the day when they will see the Lord, when they will, the Lord is the Lord's return is there. And he's saying that, you know, the Lord, the Lord will keep you blameless. That which means that they need to, you know, what does it mean? Does it mean that it'll be an automatic thing? No, they need to follow the Lord, they need to walk with the Lord, but the Lord will enable them and keep them. If they are willing, you know, if they are following, that they may be blamed. That's the will of God, right? That who will, verse 8 says, who will confirm you to the end, who will establish you to the end, so that you may be blameless, right? He will strengthen, he will make firm, he will establish. But it's also our willingness, right? So that is verse 8. Okay. Verse 9 God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So this call um, is a call unto fellowship. Okay, the Greek word used there is koinonia, which means communion, close walk, intimacy, friendship, partnership. Right. So we are called not just to be born again and get saved and wait till we reach heaven, but we are called to be partners. We are called to be close friends with Jesus. We are called into this close partnership with Jesus. Partnership meaning, okay, whatever God is doing, whatever the Lord wants to be done, we are partnering with him in getting it done. Right. So a believer's life is a life of fellowship. So he says, you know, God is faithful. He's a faithful God and he has called you into this koinonia of fellowship with Jesus, uh, and that is something that is a privilege for all of us, right? Okay, right. So we will stop here and take a break, and then uh, come back in ten minutes. Right? We'll resume at ten. Thank you.